a million of organizations all over the world have implemented their management systems according to ISO 9001 standard. What are their main benefits? Well, in fact, we just finished a project in South America uh, that was organized by UNIDO, the United Nations Industrial Development Organization, uh, where we asked exactly that question. Uh, and we've done similar projects in Asia, uh, 12 Asian developing economies and China. Uh, and we have a very good basis to be able to respond. When we asked the certified organizations, uh, the response they gave us was things like the benefits that they see externally are having access to export markets, uh, having access to be able to take part in um, tenders for government and other kind of organizations who uh, require certification, uh, but also for the internal benefits where they saw improvements in the way they manage their, uh, their processes, less rework, better communication between the different parts of the organization. Uh, and so on. Now, as far as other interested parties is concerned, we also asked purchasing organizations what they thought about the performance of their suppliers. Uh, and there, of course, there was some, some dissatisfaction with the performance of suppliers, regardless of whether they were certified or not. But overall, um, very, very clear um, benefits that certified suppliers performed better than uncertified or uh, the same organization before they achieved certification. We also asked certified organizations about the investments. And it's very, very difficult to quantify how much an organization actually spent to implement the system and to get certifi certification. But I think one of the very, very interesting pieces of information, we said, we asked them the question, regardless of how much you spent, was it a worthwhile investment? And here we're talking about data from around about 10,000 organizations worldwide. 99% of those organizations said absolutely yes, it was a very worthwhile investment. And something like 25% said yes, it was an excellent investment. So there clearly are benefits um, both for the organization itself and for the other interested parties in, in implementing and certifying ISO 9001. What were the major changes in ISO 9001 standard and uh, how they may affect the organizations and their interested parties? Well, I think, first of all, it's important to emphasize that the revision in 2015, it was a major revision, but it wasn't a revolutionary revision. It was, a, if you like, the next stage in the evolution of ISO 9001. Uh, when we look back 30 years ago, almost 30 years ago when ISO 9001 was first published, it was very prescriptive in nature. It was very uh, documentation heavy. Uh, in the year 2000, which was the first major revision, we introduced what we call the process approach, where organizations need to understand the way they operate and they need to manage their processes in order to achieve the objective, which is uh, customer satisfaction. In the 2015 version, we've taken that one step further. We've put a lot more emphasis on the actual achievement of the, uh, what we call the intended outcomes of the system. In other words, is the system really delivering on its promise to organizations, customers, that they can expect consistent conforming product? We call that output matters. So it's not just managing the processes, it's managing the processes so that they achieve the desired outcomes. Uh, second, we've incorporated what we call risk-based thinking. That doesn't necessarily mean formal risk management, but it means about encouraging the organization to think about and, where appropriate, document what might go wrong. What's the probabilities of something going wrong? What are the potential consequences if something does go wrong? Uh, uh, so that they can allocate their resources in the best possible way uh, and not necessarily uh, generate an overly bureaucratic system writing documented procedures and instructions and things for things that are maybe not so important. So that coupled with the 
let's say, judicious use of the Plan, Do, Check, Act cycle at all levels of the organisation, right from the strategic planning down to the operational activities. Those three things put together, process approach, risk-based thinking, Plan, Do, Check, Act. We hope that that will make the standard much more flexible um, and allow organisations to be much more agile and to be able to re react to changes in their business context. Uh, because we, what we don't want is uh, a system that is so rigid, so documentation heavy, that organisations say, oh, we can't improve or we can't innovate because our ISO system won't let us, which really is not what the standards should be about. So I think uh, those, those several things, more flexibility for the organisation to define how it manages its own business within its own business context, but at the same time putting more responsibility on the organisation to say, okay, you have that flexibility, now you need to demonstrate that the way you are managing your processes is actually generating the desired results. The organisations are often confused by numerous requirements from technical standards, organisation standards and so on. Uh, what is your recommendation for uh, the best possible way how to implement them? Well, I think one, one of the things that we talk about a lot in the new ISO 9001 is this question of business context. There will be organizations who are operating in highly regulated environments where there are lots of um, customer requirements, regulatory requirements, for example in the aerospace industry, uh, in the um, uh, governmental organizations, safety critical activities where uh, consumer safety is at risk. And of course there will be sometimes quite onerous uh, regulatory requirements on the product that the, the organization is providing. Now it's not ISO that says the organization has to meet all of those things. Uh, what ISO 9001 says is that the organization has to understand and identify what are the requirements that it has to meet in order to fulfill the needs and expectations of the relevant interested parties. Now traditionally that has meant the customer the contractual customer. But of course there are other uh, interested parties, not least of which is the society who is represented by the government and what we call the legitimate objectives of government is to safeguard the safety and the, uh, of its citizens and the environment. And so we see, for example, requirements, mandatory requirements for things like toys, things like safety equipment, cr motorcycle crash helmets and so on, where it's not a voluntary subscription, something you have to do, it's in the technical requirements. Uh, and so ISO 9001 is a tool that can help organisations to give themselves the confidence that they meet those requirements, but at the same time can form the basis for technical regulations in and of itself. You know, many product requirements, compulsory product certification requirements, uh, for example in the European Union, products that require CE marking, uh, they are based on what is called the uh, harmonised system of standards within the European Union. So we have the situation where conformity to a voluntary standard is taken as what we call presumption of conformity to the appropriate technical regulations. Uh, in fact, many of the, uh, the compulsory product certifications include in the assessment methodology a requirement for an organisation to have a quality management system. And if the organisation's quality management system meets the ISO 9001 requirements, that takes it a long way towards meeting the relevant technical regulations for that safety critical product. Now, that's not true of all uh, products, for example, you know, we may have a small shop selling office supplies in, in Novi Sad. They don't have to meet any governmental regulations at all for their product. They will take ISO 9001 as a voluntary standard that will help them to provide better service to their customers and probably without the, the need for a whole lot of documentation in doing that. Unfortunately, 
we have seen some abuse of certification process if it is not monitored by institutions. Is there a way uh, to fight those problems? Well, essentially what we're talking about here is the concept of market surveillance, which is a very well consolidated idea when it comes to product certification. Uh, and typically product certification involves uh, approving the type testing, looking at an organization's quality management system, uh, and approving a particular product for uh, release or, or, or sales in a particular market. But that conformity assessment process that evaluates whether the product under ideal conditions is capable of meeting the applicable uh, regulations, that needs to be monitored. And in the product certification community, this idea of market surveillance is very well consolidated. So typically, you know, go to the supermarket shelves, take a product off the shelf, and test it to make sure it does continue to meet the appropriate requirements. Um, right now, with UNIDO, United Nations Industrial Development Organization, ISO, and the IAF, International Accreditation Forum, uh, we are looking at ways to apply that thinking to management system certification, uh, whereby we could visit some of the certified organizations not to do a complete audit, but maybe to talk to top management, uh, have a quick visit around the organization, uh, discuss with some of the employees, to make sure that that really is uh, not a system that meets all 100% of all requirements, but at least that it is a valid certification. Uh, we recognize that there is a small percentage, and I really do believe it is a small percentage, of certifications uh, around the world that bring ISO 9000 into disrepute. And we all have a responsibility to do something about that. We won't do anything about that just by complaining and moaning among ourselves. We have to do something tangible and we have to make use of the feedback mechanisms that are in place via the certification bodies, via the accreditation bodies if needed, and via the International Accreditation Forum, which is the sort of highest level of um, oversight provided for certification activities. If we don't do that, and we don't do that adequately, then I agree, we run the risk of devaluing the very good and very credible certificates that I believe the vast majority of organizations um, have actually worked hard to achieve. So that, I believe, the mechanism will be some kind of a market surveillance, and that is something that is under uh, investigation and under pilot studies as, as we speak now. Mm -hmm.